Lane Detectives. I'm just going to give Tabrija one second to get the recording started. Sorry. All right. So welcome again to this very special edition of Dueling Detectives. My name is Adina. And Tabrija, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Tabrisha, and I'm the other half of the Dueling Detectives duo. All right, and we are very excited to have the honor of introducing our special guest today, Tom Mead, author of Death and the Conjurer and the Murder Reel. Welcome, Tom, and thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Adina, and uh, yes, hello to you both, hello to everybody watching, and uh, thank you for having me. Okay, so before we jump into our discussion, we do just have a few housekeeping things that we want to go over quickly. Uh, the first thing being that we do ask everyone to be mindful of the library's general policies and rules if you are using the chat option. And basically, that just means be respectful of everybody who is in this virtual space with us today. And then we do have just a quick little chart with some of the Zoom features that we have here. You are welcome to have your camera on or off. Even though this program is being recorded, you in the audience will not be recorded. We do ask that you keep yourself muted just so there's no background noise. Um, and then we encourage you to use the chat function if you have any questions or you, there's something Tom says that you love, you can feel free to put it in the chat. You can also have a little reaction to something at the bottom. It looks like a little emoji icon. Um, and then we do have closed captions enabled for this event and you would turn that on with the little CC button. And if you are to accidentally leave this meeting, if you click that big red button at the bottom, don't worry, we will let you back in. And if you do start putting questions in the chat, we will get to them at the end. Don't think we're ignoring you. We're just gonna hold on to those until the end. So before we start talking about Tom's amazing books, we wanna make sure you all know how to get these books. You are welcome to come into any of the New York Public Library's locations. We are all fully reopened except for those that are undergoing renovations. You can also get eBooks using one of our three e-reading apps. You can either come in and browse the collection to find a book, or you can put a book on hold and have it waiting for you when you come into the library. And the good news is the New York Public Library no longer charges any late fines. So if you do happen to hold on to a book, like say one of Tom's books for a few days too long, don't worry, you will not be penalized for it. Just bring it back as soon as you can. And I know this is kind of a lot of information, so don't worry. You can always check out our website. You can either call or email our help desk. And Sabrija is putting all of this info into the chat. So I am going to pass it along to Tabrija to give us a more formal introduction of our guests today. <laughs> Thank you, Adina. And hello, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and well. So I have the pleasure of introducing our special guest today, Tom Mead. So thank you again so much, Tom, for joining us this afternoon and your case this evening, because I know you're coming <laughs> in the UK. Um, so thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again for having me, Tabrisha. Yeah, you're welcome. So I want to give a short bio of our special guest today. So Tom Mead is a UK-based author specializing in crime fiction. His stories have appeared in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine, Litro Online, Flash, the International Short Story Magazine, Lighthouse, Mystery Scene, and Mystery Weekly, amongst others. Several of his pieces have been anthologized, including Heat Wave, in the Best Mystery Stories of the Year 2021, which was edited by Lee Child. His debut novel, Death and the Conjurer, was selected as one of the top 10 best mysteries of the year by Publishers Weekly. So that is a very extensive repertoire. So congratulations to that, Tom. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so in this Dueling Detectives, we have a lot of attendees who are amazing, like great, great mystery fans, including me and Adina. So we have a lot to talk about, especially with your 
well, your debut novel, Death and the Conjurer, and your second book, The Murder Wheel, that just came out a few months ago. So for those who have not had the chance to read the Joseph Spector series, could you give us like a brief synopsis of what the book is about? Absolutely, yes, with pleasure. Um, so the Joseph Spector mysteries are um, uh, vintage style locked room mysteries inspired by uh, golden age whodunits of the uh, 20s and 30s. So uh, they're set in in London. Uh, the first novel, uh, Death and the Conjurer, is set in 1936. So it's the height of the so-called golden age of detective fiction, when writers like Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, Ellery Queen, and uh, and so many others were at uh, the the peak of their powers, if you like. Um, and uh, my fictional detective is uh, Joseph Spector, as you mentioned, and he is a uh, he's a retired musical magician, so a sort of old vaudevillian uh, who, in the classic Golden Age style, is uh, recruited by a a baffled Scotland Yard to assist in unravelling a, a string of seemingly impossible crimes. Uh, the fact that he's a magician is uh, is what gives him the edge in in this uh, in in these cases because uh, he's uh, he's got a knack for unraveling seemingly supernatural or inexplicable um uh, occurrences uh, applying uh, applying a, a, a sense of logic to them and, uh, you know, uh, restoring a sense of rationality and reality. So Death and the Conjurer is the, is the first in the series. There it is. Um, and uh, it uh, it introduces Spectre. It establishes his friendship with uh, George Flint, who's a, a Scotland Yard inspector. And uh, he's embroiled in a, in a string of seemingly impossible uh, locked room crimes, two murders, and the uh, the theft of a, of an oil painting, uh, and then here is the second book, which uh, came out in the summer. This is the Murder Wheel, and uh, in this book, uh, I had a lot of fun leaning into the the theatricality of the uh, of the classic murder mystery. It's set mainly in the uh, backstage corridors of a, a fictional. Uh, theatre in London's West End. So um, uh, again, like with the first book, it, it deals with impossible crimes and uh, these bizarre, slightly surreal setups, but uh, with uh, rational, earthly explanations for for all the bizarre occurrences. Um, and uh, it also um, uh, it also reunites Spectre with uh, with Flint, and um, uh, yes, uh, both books pay tribute to the Golden Age. As I've mentioned, there are tons of references and allusions to uh, the various big name authors, uh, including my particular favourite, John Dixon Carr, who was a specialist in the locker room mystery. So, uh, so there's a brief introduction to the to the series. Uh, they're both set in the um, uh, you know, smog shrouded, lamp lit London of the 1930s. So it's a it's a, a a lovely atmospheric setting that I had so much fun just just diving into it and really you know really immersing myself in it. And like all who done it, it's uh, it's uh, very much about the puzzle and about uh, getting the reader to kind of play along and see if they can spot who done it. So uh, so there you go. There's an introduction to the series. And that is like what I really like about it because in the beginning of your um each book you give like a cast of characters and then like a and a map and then you have the narrator talking to the reader and asking them like oh come along and see if you can figure out and it's just like a very like interactive way of reading a locked room mystery and I just really absolutely enjoyed reading that. And reading Locked Room Mysteries is one of my favorite um, tropes in, in, in the mystery genre. So could you give like an, um, can you explain to our audience members who, who are not familiar with that trope, like what is a Locked Room Mystery? Like what, 
what does what is what kind of thing does it entail? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I mentioned before about impossibility, and really, that's the that's the key criteria for a locked room mystery is uh, um, is the crime or the event physically impossible. So a locked room mystery, as the, the name implies, the, the imagery of the locked room, uh, the, uh, the sealed space, the um, uh, seemingly inaccessible room. Uh, and yet uh, in a locked room mystery, the assailant or the criminal um, manages to access this room. So uh, you'll have a murder victim found in a, in a sealed room. And with no conceivable way that the that the killer could have got in or out, uh, so that gives the appearance, as I say, of something supernatural or uncanny or otherworldly going on. Um, but crucially, in a locked room mystery, the solution is always uh, is always earthly. There's no actual supernatural phenomena. It just has that appearance. So to me, that that creates a a very neat analogy with stage magic where again it's about creating the appearance of something supernatural via earthly gimmicks so it so it makes perfect sense to me to um to use a magician as a detective and to apply some of the principles of stage magic you know the uh, the theory behind stage illusions to the field of murder mystery writing it just seems like a match made in heaven really and um uh, I, I talk about impossible crimes as a more loose interpretation of the locked room mystery because uh, they're not always uh, literally locked rooms. Uh, really, it's it, any um, any fictional setup where the uh, uh, appearance of supernatural phenomena uh, takes place. But uh, of course, as I say, it's the application of logic and rationality that, that unravels the puzzle behind it. That I mean, you just explained why I love it because I, I love trying to just like read puzzles and trying to figure it out for myself, and then at the end be proven wrong and <laughs> be proven as a, as an idiot. Like, yeah, oh, could not have gotten that part. But but you mentioned like Agatha Christie, John Dickens, Dick, um, Dixon Carr, and and Dorothy L. Sayers, and you mentioned that in in um in the Joseph Spector series about the aspect of like a locked room and it seems like it even in 2023 it's still a trope that's so popular why do you feel that a lot of readers like gear towards it and they and and they call to it and they just still so fascinated and amazed by um a locked room mystery well uh, i mean like yourself i'm a i'm an avid reader of locked room mysteries i'm i actively seek out the most uh you know the most bizarre sounding uh, strange and surreal mysteries just because they have an atmosphere about them which i love which i think comes from the uh, the gothic tradition you know the influence of edgar Allan poe and that that sort of thing i think it can be traced all the way back to poe um and that uh, that thread of the gothic is still there i think um uh, but also the intellectual challenge, you know, the the uh, the idea of a game of of cat and mouse between the writer and the reader. That's what I love as a as a reader, uh, and that's the kind of thing that I wanted to play up in the writing of uh, of these mysteries. Um, the the great thing about Golden Age Who Done It is that uh, they, um, if you like, they were they were quite postmodern in that they had an awareness of themselves as as novels as fictions and so um in Ellery Queen for instance you would have the challenge to the reader which would be the point where the um uh, the, the author would effectively step out of the the plot and address the reader directly and say you know you, you've had all the clues um and uh, can you deduce who done it um so uh, i wanted to try and recapture that that element of um uh you know uh directly engaging with the reader um talking to them directly and uh just um i suppose having a having an awareness of the reader's perspective which uh, which is something that the magicians have of course because they are focused entirely 
on uh, guiding their audience's attention. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's the approach that I, I take with writing mysteries. It's about making sure that the audience is looking the wrong way um, so that they don't spot how the trick works. That's, uh, that's the, the fun of it, but, but also that's the key challenge. You know, that's the sort of make or break for a locker room mystery. Um, yes, uh, it, it's also about having the clues in, in plain sight so that when the reader's attention is drawn back to them, it creates that sense of, of uh, retrospective I inevitability where you, uh, you see how you've been tricked and you, uh, you, know, you, you realize that it was there all along in plain sight, but because of the, the skill of you know, John Dixon Carr, Ellery Queen or whoever, you just didn't spot it. So, so that's the appeal to me as a reader and that's the, uh, well, I suppose those are all the elements that I'm trying to build into the Spectre series and to uh, uh, to pay tribute to the authors that I love and the uh, the era that I find so fascinating as well. So it seems like you have a, a lot of experience in, and also in writing Lacton Mystery. So Adina and I definitely wanted to ask this, ask this question. What would be your dream setting of a locker mystery? Like what, like what would be something that either you would want to write yourself or you just absolutely love and you would like to see on in a book or on page in the movies, stuff like that. Yeah, that's I mean, that's a great question because uh I suppose when you're dealing with a, a genre that's so well established and with the uh, the uh, the tropes and the themes that are so familiar, it can be hard to come up with something new within that. Um, uh, my my novels are period novels. They're set in the thirties, as I say. Uh, I'm drawn to the theatrical setting because, of course, uh, you know you've got the themes of impersonation and deception, and you've got uh, you know a cast of unlikely characters all assembled under one roof, that kind of thing. So, to me, the theatrical setting suits my purposes. But um, more widely speaking. Uh, I'm fascinated by uh, escape rooms as a concept. Uh, I think they are um, uh, that kind of distillation of of what makes uh, locked room mysteries enjoyable. You know that that uh, that puzzle solving. They tap into some of the same uh, same parts of the brain. I think, and uh, I think it would be fun to combine them and to write a contemporary locked room set within an escape room or, or involving an escape room uh, just because that would uh, you know it would it would add like with the classic mysteries an element of self-awareness uh, which I think would be fun it could be a bit playful I would definitely want to read that Adina and I did an escape room once and I think we had 45 minutes left until <laughs> You think we finished it with 45 minutes left? I don't no, think no, that's no. exactly no, no, how no, it went no. down. We had 45 minutes left. We did not finish it in 45 minutes. <laughs> no, no, we no. Had we, <laughs> we did not. We had... <laughs> oh, wait, no. I think we had 10 minutes left. <laughs> I think we maybe had like two minutes left at the very end. <laughs> there was a lot of pushing in, trying to figure out, like, let's figure this out. Um, so I have one more question before I pass it off to Dino. So it with your Joseph Spectre series, they seem to be so intricately, like with very intricate plots. Like how do you, when you're writing out these novels, like how do you go, what is your plan on writing it? Do you have like an eraser board or post-it notes, like trying to figure out like where, where go, what goes where and who's going to escape what? What, what's your writing out plan? <laughs> well, I actually, um, I, I plot it very closely to begin with. So I will have a very clear beginning, middle and end. I will know the gimmick that I'm going to use, the uh, the deceptions that are going to be there, the, uh, the red herrings, all that kind of thing I will have to begin with. Uh, and that will all be... Uh, uh, it'll, it'll all be sketched out quite, in quite a detailed way. Um, but then as I 
dive into the, the actual writing, I'll find that I'm uh, uh, being a bit, a bit looser and a bit more free and easy with my approach and uh, just having a bit more fun with it. So I know that some writers tend to, uh, you know, sketch things out quite loosely and then they build up the plot around that. But uh, my approach is, is different in that I begin with a very tight plot. And uh, then the rest of the writing and editing is kind of uh, an exercise in, uh, uh, you know, expanding on that and just, uh, uh, just again, being a bit playful, a bit imaginative and creative within that. So I like to uh, leave myself a bit of breathing room within a plot so that I can, uh, you know, build up a secondary character who's caught my attention and that sort of thing. Uh, I, um, I always... I've talked about having, you know, that awareness of the reader's perspective. And I, I like to try and, and keep the reader at the forefront of my mind when I'm writing. Uh, I, I try to write with a with a uh, a reader's eye, if you like, and uh, latch on to the things that, that appeal to me, the, the things that would interest me if I if I were reading the book. So um uh I, I suppose it's uh it's not an exact science, but what I tend to do with the actual plotting, so the, the who done it and the how, etc., I will use a timeline. Um, I uh, I keep that quite uh, detailed, and I'm quite meticulous and rigorous with it. Uh, but what I have is I will also have a parallel timeline alongside that. So I will have what really happened. I'll have the you know the events laid out in chronological order. But then I will have what the reader thinks happened in a separate timeline. So it'll become quite a, a scientific exercise, really, of seeing where these two timelines overlap and that kind of thing. Um, and it's it's quite a fun way to to just build up the plot. So that that's my approach to begin with. And then um, and then, like I say, it, it becomes more a question of, you know, the creativity, the 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 fun imaginative side of it, the uh, uh, bringing the characters together and uh, that sort of thing. That seems, and you can really tell with <laughs> the stories because I was just like really absorbed and I, in myself, and I was trying to figure out like, how did they do it? And when Joseph revealed <laughs> everything, I was like, yeah, I didn't get it. <laughs> didn't get That's it. great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I never uh, actually solve locked room mysteries when I'm reading them. Uh, I'm not I'm not good at solving them at all. But what I will do is I will try and devise my own solutions as I'm going along. I like to try and play along. Um, but I find that even an incorrect solution can be useful because it can give you the germ of an idea that you can use for something else, you know. So uh, I think even being fooled by a John Dixon Carr or an Agatha Christie, it can be instructive because it uh, can send you off in your own imaginative direction. Yeah, I was definitely fooled a lot of times and always a happy experience. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Dina to finish the rest of our questions. So go ahead, Adina. Thank you, Tabrija. So I know we've talked a little bit about Joseph Spector himself already, but I wanted to ask how you came up with this amazing character, this magician detective. Where did he come from? <laughs> That's kind of you to say. He He's uh, definitely a, um, uh, a colorful character. He's very much in the tradition of the uh, classic golden age sleuth you know the amateur detective uh, all the way back to uh, Sherlock Holmes I suppose you know this idea of a, a kind of lone wolf uh, who's not uh, a member of the law enforcement agencies or anything like that he's um, and he's not even particularly interested in uh, injustice or anything like that it's more about the the uh, the game the challenge of unraveling the mystery you know so I think that all uh, that is all quite um, uh, on brand with the golden age detectives you know uh, you have people like Barrow for instance who's a you know an inquiry agent that sort of thing but who is um, uh, who's got that sort of unique eye that um, uh, that uh, kind of penetrating eye that can see things that other people can't um but the idea of having him as a magician uh 
uh, it uh, it came from my reading uh, around stage magic. I am fascinated by stage magic and the history of it. Um, and you know, for instance, uh, some of the uh, some of the great illusions that were devised during the late Victorian era, and which would become uh, commonplace in theatrical practice. But when they were initially devised. Things like uh, Pepper's Ghost, for instance, which is a uh, uh, quite literally an exercise in smoke and mirrors to create an illusion on stage. Uh, when these tricks were first devised, they really did have the appearance of being something supernatural, you know. Uh, so um, that, uh, to me, that lends itself very neatly to the uh, development of a mystery plot. Um, when I started writing about Spectre, I, I started with short stories. Uh, you mentioned a few at the beginning. I wrote for Ellery Queen magazine, for instance, for instance, and Alfred Hitchcock mystery magazine, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, those stories, many of them were based on magic tricks and gimmicks. Uh, I would effectively take the the principle behind the magic trick. So the uh, the um, uh, the, the kind of core of the illusion itself and I would uh, extrapolate it and and turn it into a mystery plot so uh, really it was um, uh, you know it was uh, it was very much kind of springboarded from the magic tricks themselves uh, so um, it, it made perfect sense to me to have a character who was a magician somebody who was kind of between the, the worlds of mystery and illusion um and it was also an excuse for me to set the novels in and around london's theater land because i'm a, a huge lover of theater um and I'm, I'm fascinated by it and um uh, again theatrical mysteries are a a favorite kind of sub sub genre of mine i love for instance, uh, Nio Marsh, who was a Golden Age mystery author, who wrote primarily mysteries set within theatrical locales. And um, to me, it's just a, a, a particularly evocative setting, and one that I think has got so many possibilities. So uh, so that's why I made Spectre a magician. And um, I've deliberately kept his personal life and his past and that kind of thing quite... Uh, quite oblique I'm not very uh forthcoming with details about him as a character because I think that that adds something you know uh I think um and also I'm keen to make sure that the the novels can be enjoyed as standalones so uh, I uh, I like to just uh keep the details of his character um in the shadows so to speak but to have his personality be very prominent so uh, I, I like to uh, I like to think of him as uh, you know somebody who kind of haunts the narrative you don't know much about him but he's always sort of his his personality is always there you know and I think that's the sort of thing that is true of um, characters like Hercule Poirot for instance who uh, you know they have very distinct personas and their eccentricities and foibles are very well established, even though uh, you may not know uh, the the, the uh, fleshed out details of their past. So, uh, so again, it, it's about paying tribute to the golden age tradition, and uh, you know, just uh, having a bit of fun with uh, uh, building this character uh, by degrees. Thank you. I love that idea of him haunting the book. <laughs> Uh, so we did want to ask if you could insert Joseph into any other locked room mystery, where would you want to see him? What mm. world would you want to drop him into? Yeah, that's a great question again. Um, well, I've talked a lot about uh, John Dixon Carr. He is my favorite author from the Golden Age. He is the uh, um, so-called master of the locked room mystery. He was one of the most prolific and uh, ingenious innovators within that genre uh, but there was a, another author who I admire whose name was Pete Colbert that was his pseudonym uh, his real name was Henning Nelms and he was a um, uh, he was a pro professional magician by trade so he was an illusionist and he wrote books about the theory of magic and things like that which are fascinating but he only wrote two novels uh, during the golden age 
And the second of these is a, it's a book called uh, Rim of the Pit. And it's a, a fantastic, impossible crime tale. It's got locked rooms. It's got, uh, you know, seemingly supernatural occurrences. It's got a, a, a group of people um, stranded in a snowbound cabin. Uh, and seemingly besieged by supernatural forces. So it's a fantastically atmospheric piece of work. It's got, you know, it's got seances. It's got all the kind of fun, theatrical, gothic uh, trappings, um, which uh, which I love in, in Locked Room Mysteries. And um, I think it's one of the, one of the very best uh, Locked Rooms. And uh, I would, uh, I would love to see Spectre, who is a deliberately quite an out there character, he's quite uh, he's theatrical. He likes to uh, make an entrance. He likes to uh, build a bit of suspense and that kind of thing. So I think he would fit well into that that locale, that setting among those characters. Right, that sounds amazing. I'll have to check out that book. Um, we know you might not be able to answer this question, but we have to ask. But can we expect to see any more Joseph Specter? What's next for you? Well, there is a third book on the way that is called Cabaret Macabre. So uh, again, I'm playing up the practicality. I'm having a lot of fun with it, um, uh, building the atmosphere and kind of, uh, you know, trying to capture that sense of the Gothic, which is, is what I love. Unlike the first two books, Cabaret Macabre is a more of a country house mystery. It's in a, a rural setting um, and uh, it's set at a you know, kind of rambling old mansion, um, which is a, a departure because, uh, as I said, the first two books are set in, in London. But um, apart from that, it, it's very much in the spirit of the first two books. You've got uh, um, Spectre is brought in uh, to assist the, the, uh, a family who lives at this, uh, at this country house, Marchbank, who are being picked off one by one by a, a seemingly phantom assailant. So it's uh, very much in the tradition of those uh, the first two books. And again, we've got a string of impossibilities and a... Uh, a few other fun uh, illusions along the way. Uh, so that's Cabaret Macabre. That comes out, uh, that's published like the first two books. Uh, it's published by Mysterious Press. That'll be out in July of 2024. Oh, great. That's so exciting. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, so usually in Dueling Detectives, what we do is Tabrija and I pick two literary detectives and we kind of pit them against each other. We compare and contrast them. And then we ask our audience to vote on which detective they think would crack the case first. So if you were to see Joseph Spector go up against another literary detective, uh, who would you want to see him matched up against? Well, I initially I would be tempted to put him alongside John Dixon Carr's two Great detective characters Gideon Fell and Henry Merivale, who are both very uh, colourful, larger than life, eccentric, uh, boisterous characters. But thinking about it, um, I think they would have, if anything, too much in common. Um, I think they would be uh, they would be too well matched, and their approaches would be too similar. So what I would uh, be inclined to do is to pair Spectre up with somebody whose approach was very different, very um, perhaps less deductive and more um, scientific and, and methodical. So um, there was an author called R. Austin Freeman who created a detective character called Dr. Thorndike, who was a precursor to the great Golden Age detectives. He was in the, the mould of Sherlock Holmes, but he was billed as the scientific detective. Um, and uh, his approach was very... So a lot of the puzzles he faced were, were similar to, uh, uh, to Spectre's in that there were locked room mysteries, there were closed circle whodunits with uh, you know, a, a good cast of, of suspects to choose from. But his methods were so different and they often... Uh, relied on a, a specific piece of scientific knowledge and that kind of thing, which I think would be an interesting contrast with Spectre. Um, my other choice would be uh, a, an American author called Helen McCloy. She wrote a brilliant series featuring a psychiatrist detective who was called Dr. Willing. 
and um, uh, her books have a fabulous sense of the gothic and a, a superb atmosphere. Uh, she was a brilliant plotter, like John Dixon Carr was, and like Agatha Christie was. Um, but uh, I think the psychological angle is something that uh, appealed to her uh, perhaps more than it does to the, those other authors. And that's uh, something that she uh, she focuses on in her work and in the development of Dr. Willing as a character. So, um, uh, so I think uh, either of those two detectives, I think their methodologies and their approaches would be different enough that they would create a few sparks alongside Spectre. Thank you. I think I saw Tabrija jotting those those names down. So uh, <laughs> keep your eyes out for future Dueling Detective programs to come. Um, so we always like to, whenever we have an author, show them some of the previous matchups we've done and ask which detective you would pick and kind of compare your answer to what our audience had picked. So we have just a few matchups that we want to get uh, your opinion on. So I'm just going to share my screen again quickly. And we will ask you to pick which of these detectives would you want to hire? Which one you think would crack the case first? So next <laughs> up, we have dueling teen detectives, the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew. Uh, to be honest, uh, my my favorite is the three investigators by uh, the, the, um, the other series that the kind of third teen detective series. Um, but I think between these two, it would certainly be Nancy Drew. Um, she she appeared in more mysteries, as I recall, and they were they were they were of a higher um, standard in terms of plot. I think uh, they were a bit more um, a bit more sophisticated plot wise. Um, but uh, if I had to choose uh, a teen detective series, I would actually go for the three investigators. Many of those were written by Robert Arthur and they were, they, some of them had locked room mysteries. They were great. Who knew there were so many teen detectives, but Nancy <laughs> Drew was the winner um, of this particular matchup. So next up we have our TV detectives, uh, oh, wow. Stabler and Benson from Law and Order SVU or Midsummer Murders. <laughs> Well, Midsummer Murders is is closer to my kind of uh, um, my kind of field. Uh, some of those plots are so outlandish. The casts of suspects are so uh, you know so unique and and bizarre and interesting, and often highly theatrical. Um, so I, I would I would lean towards Midsummer Murders. Um, but you know, I'm I'm biased because <laughs> you know, Midsummer Murders was the winner, which I think <laughs> surprised Tabriz and I, just because we thought Law and Order is easier to view here. Um, but Midsummer Murders, I guess, has been Midsummer on Murders forever. Is, uh, yes, Midsummer Murders is uh, it's inescapable over here. It's it's one of those shows. It's uh... <laughs> I'm watching the new season. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> So we know you like Agatha Christie, so this one might be a tough bet. I think this was the very first program we ever did, Miss Marple versus Poirot. Mm, this is a good one. Uh, it's not actually particularly difficult for me. I am immediately drawn to Hercule Poirot. He is the outright winner for me because uh, I think overall the Poirot novels are the more carefully plotted they are the ones where Christie is really firing on all cylinders in the Miss Marple novels many of them like uh, the body in the library and the murder of the creature they're really excellent but then you come across um for instance 450 from Paddington I forget what the U.S. title is for that one but uh, it's it's a it's a fun book it's a really interesting book to uh, to read but Miss Marple's detection leaves a lot to be desired. And if, like me, you, you are trying to follow along and, uh, you know, uh, track her deductions, you just can't really do it. Uh, she makes some real leaps of logic that uh, you, you, I find it hard to follow. Uh, and uh, so for that reason, I would go with Hercule Poirot. Okay, so this one, Miss Marple was the winner. 
think people didn't like uh, Poirot's ego so much when <laughs> we were discussing well, these books. Miss Marple has her moments as well, I think. <laughs> Something about an old busybody, I guess. People like. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, love them. I do love them both, I have to say. And then since we kind of put Sherlock Holmes in a league of his own, we do ask which variation of Sherlock Holmes do you prefer? We know this is not all of them. So if your favorite didn't make the list, uh, that can also be your answer. But we have Jeremy Brett, Benedict Cumberbatch, Johnny Lee Miller, and Robert Downey Jr. Well, um, this is this is an interesting one. Um, Jeremy Brett, I suppose, is the closest to the character as written. Um, I I do have a uh, um an appreciation for Johnny Lee Miller in uh, in Elementary, uh, and uh, I, I also enjoy the Robert Downey Jr. film for tapping into the um uh I suppose the the more adventurous spirit of the home stories. Uh, uh, when I was young, they used to show the uh, black and white Basil Rathbone films on TV. Uh, so that was my introduction to Sherlock Holmes. Um, so that's one that will always be a favourite of mine. Uh, and uh, the Hammer horror films, they, they did a, a Hammer version of Hound of the Baskervilles where Peter Cushing played Sherlock Holmes. Peter Cushing with his, with his sort of, uh, his kind of, his gaunt, hollow-cheeked appearance uh he was definitely uh, an influence on the description of joseph specter so uh, i think his uh, the the image of him as sherlock holmes is one that really stuck with me as well um but i'd be interested to see what people picked for this one because it's a, it's a tough one i think we were surprised to see that robert downey jr actually yeah. won this yeah. one i thought it would be ben cumberbatch but I, I think, think the Iron Man effect. Yeah, I think it was like the either the second to last movie or the last Avengers movie was coming out, and so people were real. They were on their Robert Downey Jr. high, so that I feel like that's why they picked. Him. Well, Not Robert to say Downey that we don't Jr. Like those. He, I, 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 um, I did enjoy his performance in the first film. Uh, he has got a certain, um, you know, he captures that kind of fast talking uh, eccentric quality which i think is really good and he's terrific in in oppenheimer i think he's uh, he's superb so i'm a big robert downey jr fan but it is a surprise that he was the favorite okay and then we wanted to ask which one of these uh mysteries would you rather be locked in with if you were stuck in one of these remote locations <laughs> we picked a few different um mysteries older ones newer ones and we threw in a movie for fun so we yes. have the hunting party by lucy foley and then there were none by agatha christie of course shiver by ali reynolds one by one by ruth ware and of course clue the classic film well i love clue um madeline khan she's uh so great and of course uh and curry uh, et al it's a fantastic film that's one that i saw when i was young which is great fun um but i think the obvious choice for me would be and then there were none um the the novel is uh um well of those uh, that you mention it, it's it's the only one with a a, a a real impossible crime uh so that is definitely uh my choice and also uh the setting is so evocative it's this story is so influential um yeah to me that's the winner by a by country mile thank you for playing we did have a tie with this one yeah. uh the hunting party and then there were none i would pick clue personally because i love that movie <laughs> yes i love the movie as well it's great fun um and I don't know if I would make it through and then there were none alive but... no I wouldn't <laughs> I would be on the boat I would be at the edge of the islands like I'll wait you guys can be in the house I'm, I'm I, I don't think I would make it through <laughs> <laughs> um so Regia, we did have a few questions from the audience do you want to go ahead and ask those yes. so we have the first one from Emily she asks Tom how do you build tension as you write. Mm, 
Yeah, uh, that's a really good question because, of course, a key element of a, a good who done it is, uh, you know, mis you know misguiding uh, the the reader's attention and and uh, keeping them on their toes, so to speak. So I think um, my approach would be to, um, I suppose, just to uh, focus on avoiding the uh, the obvious option to uh, to always. Um, uh, to always approach things laterally and to, uh, to um, uh, you know, if you're creating uh, a fictional situation where you've got suspects uh, gathered together under one roof, it's uh, about um, avoiding the cliche and, uh, um, uh, I suppose, uh, subverting the cliche where you can. I think, to me, that is the, uh, the thing that interests me uh, the most about character development when I'm reading a Who Done It, it's um, what do they, how do they behave uh, in a way that is uh, unpredictable or inexplicable? And to me, that's the root of an impossible crime and uh, um, Who Done It generally. It's uh, it's about looking at the behaviour of characters and seeing uh, the, um, you know, uh, trying to understand the uh, psychology behind their behaviour. So uh, I think that's the key to building up tension, really, is just having a, a focus on character motivation and um, uh, having an understanding, really, of the way that your characters relate to one another. Um, I think you need to have that so that you can... Uh, um, so that you can misdirect your reader's attention and send them the, looking the wrong way. Uh, you need to have a, uh, a really... Um, a really deep understanding of what the characters are thinking so that you can misdirect the reader. And uh, yeah, so that, that's my answer to that question. A great answer. And she has a second question. Can you share more about how you approach crafting your outline in uh, the, the beginning, middle and end for Locked Room Mysteries? Mm. Well, there are two different approaches. Um, Sometimes I will start with the impossibility. So I'll have a question, you know, I'll think, for instance, um, a character steps through a revolving door that doesn't emerge on the other side. They vanish into thin air. So it'll be um, a question of working out how that could possibly be achieved and why. Um, or at the other end of the scale, it will be coming across a gimmick that appeals to me uh, in my reading about stage magic and illusions. And it'll be uh, uh, trying to construct a scenario which uh, which mirrors that gimmick so that I can uh, use the uh, same trick to a different effect in my plot. So, um, uh, so, yeah, broadly speaking, it's either the question comes first, so the impossibility, or the answer comes first, the solution, the gimmick. Um, so uh, my approach is pretty much 50-50 uh, between those two, but uh, it's usually one or the other. Thank you. And we have one more question, last question, and it's from TJ. Are you an author that requires complete solitude and quiet, quiet or need distraction and drama for inspiration? Well, uh, I, um, I'm a writer who, I work in cafes a lot, I work in libraries, of course. Uh, I like to seek out, um, uh, you know, external environments to work in. And I am a, uh, uh, a big people watcher as well. Oftentimes you'll, uh, you know, you'll catch a, a stray um, phrase, turn a phrase from a conversation that will set your imagination going and can help with developing character and uh, can even stimulate ideas plot wise as well so I'm definitely a writer who needs to uh, needs to be out there needs to be uh, working um, out in the open so just thank you and um, so unfortunately we are almost out of time so before we end this wonderful program. We did ask Tom what was his favorite mysteries of this year so far. And I don't know, Tom, if you want to briefly talk about the books that you have chosen. 
Yeah, with pleasure. Um, they are all uh, they're all classic mysteries, really, um, because that's mainly what I tend to read. Um, Baddis Mitchell wrote uh, a very long series with the uh, detective uh, Mrs. Bradley, who um, uh, who is a, a fascinating eccentric character, a product of the golden age. Uh, when last I died is um, uh, a particular favourite of mine this year because it's uh, it deals with a supposedly haunted house. So again, it's got that sense of the gothic, which I thought was uh, really effective and well done. Uh, the Four Just Men is the first in a series by Edgar Wallace, the great th thriller writer. Um, and um, it's a very early work. It's from around 1906 or something like that. So before the Golden Age. But at the same time, it feels so contemporary when you read it now. And his plotting was really superb. Um, he, uh, he was great at devising situations and scenarios that would... Uh, um, that would evoke suspense. It's a real page turner, even now, um, even even you know, well over a hundred years later. Uh, Wilder's Walk Away is uh, a, quite an eerie mystery by Herbert Green. It was uh, a novel that I was not particularly familiar with, but it does have a very strong reputation among murder mystery fans, and it's got some great impossibilities. But it's also got, in the the style of uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles, it's got a a family curse, which uh, which is irresistible to me as a as a, a theme within a plot. It uh, it's got this curse that's passed down through the generations, and of course our um, detective is is there to lay the ghost, so to speak. Um, the Grindle Nightmare is by uh, Jonathan Stagg. That was a pen name used by authors who also wrote as Patrick Quentin and Hugh Patrick. Um, so um, very prolific Golden Age authors. The Grindle Nightmare, it feels very ahead of its time because it's a very dark and violent novel, it has to be said, with a, a very clever mystery at its heart and uh, a, a brilliant solution, which of course I didn't see coming. And then lastly, my, my, uh, my uh, top read of the year was The Millhouse Murders by Yukito Ayatsuji. I'm a huge fan of Japanese crime fiction generally. Uh, I think Japanese authors have a um, real mastery of uh, creating impossible scenarios and uh, I suppose uh, again evoking a, a, an atmosphere of something eerie and uncanny. Um, Yukito Aitsuji also wrote The Decagon House Murders which is a masterpiece and is heavily inspired by And Then There Were None so fans of And Then There Were None should definitely seek out the Deckergan House Murders. Uh, the Mill House Murders had never been translated before. I believe it's from the, uh, the late 80s, perhaps, but uh, this is the first time it's appeared in English. So, um, uh, yes, that was my favourite read of the year. It's a lot through mystery. It's got uh, uh, an ingenious parallel timeline set up, which I love. Um, and, uh, yeah, impossible crimes, dismembered corpses, you name it. It's uh, It's got everything. Thank you so much for sharing your favorites with us. And we will be sending these slides out to everyone in attendance. So if you want to read those books, you don't have to you know, scribble the titles down. We will send all that info with you. Unfortunately, NYPL only has copies of a few of these books because they are so old. But mm -hmm. the good news is we do have copies of Tom's books. We have both Death and the Conjurer and The Murder Wheel in all formats, ebook and ebook and print book sorry so you can check those out at the library and we do want to just let everyone know that next month we will be sharing our favorite mysteries of 2023 Teresa just put the link in the chat so we hope some of you can join us so we can, as we discuss some of those mysteries and then, of course, we want to just say thank you so much again to Tom for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, especially, you know, it's such a busy time of year. So we really appreciate you joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody for watching. And uh, yes, thanks to you, Adina, and uh, you, Tabrija, and of course, the uh, ASL interpreter. <laughs> And Tabrita did just put all of Tom's info in the chat. So we encourage you to follow him on all platforms and check out his website.
Yes, so thank you everyone so much for joining us. This is the last Dueling Detectives of 2023, so we will be seeing you in 2024. Thank you everyone so much. Have a happy holidays, happy new year, and we hope to see you in the new year. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our interpreters, as always. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Tom, Tabrizia, and Adina, another fabulous detective, dueling detectives. Happy thank holidays you, to everyone. <laughs> happy holidays. Thank you. Bye-bye now. <laughs>